Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and to make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. With these words, I welcome you to this podcast service from the Pottery Methodist Church. Today's message begins a series around the great teaching by the Lord Jesus, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. My name is Edward Brown, and I'm a minister here in Pottery Let us pray. Wonderful Heavenly Father, praise your name as Adonai, the great master and supreme owner, the name that is being used to respectfully address you by generations of your Hebrew people for more than 5,000 years. It is when you are praised as Adonai that all creation acknowledges and knows that you are the great master over all kings and rulers, that you have watched them rise and fall from the time of the first self-proclaimed king, Nimrod, down through the ages until the day when you accept the homage of all before your throne at the end of time, when you will judge the living and the dead. It is when you are praised as Adonai, that all remember that you are the great owner of all that you created, and that the universe and all within it belongs to you. Praise your holy name, Father Adonai. Praise to your name, Saviour Lord Jesus Christ, you who were called Master by your disciples but only recognized as the son of the living God by a handful of men and women during your earthly ministry. Praise to your name in anticipation of the day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise your name for your love which reached out to us from the cross where you sacrificed yourself for us while earthly masters expect their subjects to die for them. Precious Holy Spirit, sweet comforter promised by Christ Jesus the Lord, praise be your name. You who bring the sweet message of salvation from sin and death, freely offered by a loving Father and Master through the willing death of His only begotten Son, praise your name. Blessed Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we declare like David did in Psalm 16, that you are our God, our Master who has blessed us with good things here on earth and to whom we look for the immortal blessings that you have promised to all who call upon your name. And so we join together in prayer in the words that Jesus gave his church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of praise for today is John Newton's How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. And it is hymn 99 in the Methodist hymnal. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. It makes the wounded spirit whole and calms the troubled breast. It is manna to the hungry soul and to the weary rest. Dear name, the rock on which I build my shield and hiding place, my never-failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace. Jesus, my shepherd, brother, friend, my prophet, priest, and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Weak is the effort of my heart, and cold my warmest thought, but when I see thee as thou art, I'll praise thee as I ought. Till then I would thy love proclaim with every fleeting breath, and may the music of thy name refresh my soul in death.
lesson for today is taken from Matthew's Gospel, and I commence reading at chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. My address this morning is entitled, The Blessed Poor. Jesus, the young rabbi from Nazareth, was gaining a name for himself as someone worth listening to. He was not orthodox and boring. In fact, his approach to the Jewish religion was novel and interesting. His teachings were peppered with stories and parables that people could take home with them and thereby recreate for others what they had heard from him. It was a result of this growing fame that he found himself surrounded by eager listeners one day, probably in Galilee, and gave what is known to us as the Sermon on the Mount. This set of teachings, which includes chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel, will be the rich source of my messages over the next few weeks. The writer tells us that the Lord Jesus went up a mountainside, sat down, and once his disciples had gathered around him, began to teach. To us, this just seems like an ordinary introduction. But that is because we are not first-century Jewish Christians, for that was Matthew's target audience. They would be reading this account for the first time. To them, this introduction shouted, Pay attention to what is to follow. You see, Jewish tradition linked mountains or hills to places where God met people. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and he revealed his power over the prophets of Baal through Elijah on Mount Carmel. So, this was a God event that Matthew was recording. Secondly, a rabbi usually taught on the move, and he only sat down when he did not wish anything to distract his students from the lesson that was to follow. Thirdly, the Greek phrase, Anoxis to Soma means more than he began to teach. Directly translated, it means he opened his mouth and implies an oration such as the great speeches heard in the Roman Senate or those of the Greek philosophers in the public auditoria where the orator poured wondrous truths out of his heart and spirit and into the empty but expectant vessels of his audience. No, the first readers would have been sitting on the edges of their seats, awaiting the very words of God. And they were right to do so, because these chapters are the very laws and codes of Jesus' new kingdom. But like the Lord's original audience, Matthew's readers certainly would not have expected those words to be, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But before we unpack this teaching, which is referred to as the first of the Beatitudes, 
Let us look at this word usually translated as blessed. The Greek word is makarioi, which is better rendered in the Good News Bible as happy. But this is not the happiness associated with luck, which changes all the time. Rather, it is the happy condition of being right with God morally at the very core of one's being. So now let us try to understand something so important that it was the first thing that Jesus taught. Our Lord began with, Blessed happy are the poor in spirit. The word poor in the Greek is not a flattering one. Tochoi refers to the crouching, servile attitude of the beggar. The one who knows he or she is destitute and throws himself on the mercy of another for help. This is the proper attitude of a child of God. Please note that despite using the word tochoi, this teaching is not a glorification of being poor. The poor are not especially God's people, despite what some liberation theologians argued not so long ago. Material poverty is not a blessing. More often it is a terrible curse and leads to all kinds of social evils and criminal behavior. It is not a happy or blessed state to be in. So let us return to this teaching. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And see what the Lord wanted his followers to know. By the blessed poor, Jesus was referring to the person who realizes their spiritual helplessness before God. Where the serious seeker realizes that man's wisdom and science is unable to answer the truly big questions of life. Questions like, where did I come from? What is my purpose for being here? What happens after death? Then that person knows their state of poverty before God, and it becomes the key to being blessed by him. When the pilgrim realizes that although they are spiritually bankrupt, that the Heavenly Father has an overabundance of spiritual blessings which he longs to give to his children, that pilgrim then begins to approach that state of makarioi, blessed happiness. The person knows they have so little in their spiritual bank account that they are in fact bankrupt, that they need to beg from God. This is the way every person should honestly evaluate their life, because in truth, this is a state of every one of us. It was a state that Isaiah recognized himself when he had his great vision of God's throne room. Most of us would have thought, well, I've arrived. God is allowing me to see the most wonderful things. What a spiritual giant I am. But instead, Isaiah cried, and I paraphrase him, I'm in trouble. I'm a sinful man seeing the Holy God, and I'm not entitled to see him. That's from Isaiah 6, verse 5. God's holiness had convicted Isaiah of his sin, and he knew he had nothing. This was also the attitude of Mary of Bethany, when she removed her headscarf before using her hair to dry off the oil, which she had just liberally poured over the Lord Jesus' feet. His holy presence had convicted her of her inner sin, and she felt she was unworthy to cover her hair, as was the universal practice of good, moral Jewish women. This admission of being a sinner is the prerequisite state for the person to approach God. It is the state where we recognize, like Isaiah and Mary, that we are less than we wish to be, as I refer to this condition in chapter 53, verse 6, and I paraphrase him. We are all like sheep that have strayed, every one of us going our own way. Paul, in his letter to the Romans in chapter 3, verse 23, simply said, and this is the Living Bible's version, Yes, all have sinned, all for short of God's glorious ideal. It is knowing deep inside our spirit that our noblest and best actions, thoughts and words are tainted by sin in some way. It is this confession of destitution that declares us to be spiritually poor. Along with this confession comes the almost impossible to comprehend knowledge 
that despite our rebellion and sinfulness, that God loves me. That understanding strips away my pride. The pride that says, I can get right with God on my own. This pride manifests itself in three ways. Through religious actions, intellectual superiority, and materialism. There was a lot of religious pride around in Jesus' day. The Pharisees were very dedicated in their religious observance of the law. They believed that as a result of their morally upright lives and religious practices like fasting and tithing, that they had earned God's full approval and that he owed them salvation. Their strongest point had become their greatest sin through pride, and so they lost everything, not understanding that one can only be saved as Paul, who himself was an ex-Pharisee, put it, that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's from Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. Confession of sinfulness nullifies my intellectual pride. The intellectual pride like that of the Sadducees and the Greek-inspired Gnostic Christians, which caused them to believe that they knew all about God, and so he would have to admit them to his presence. Of such people, Paul, a great intellectual mind in his own right, wrote, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know what he ought to know. That's from 1 Corinthians 8 verses 1 and 2. The materialistic person takes pride in what they own, or where, or what car they drive, or where they go on holiday. They often believe they can buy God's blessings, just as Simon the magician did in Acts 8 from verse 18 onwards. The true sadness of this person is that they can never understand the truth of Christ Jesus' words as found in Luke 12, 15. That a man's life does not consist of the value of his possessions. No, my confession on being empty alone opens my way to being among the blessed of God. Do those who acknowledge themselves among the poor, Christ Jesus promised that the kingdom of God belongs to them. Although one day we will be present in God's kingdom, at this time the kingdom is a state of being in every believer's life. It is found in the life of the faithful where God's will is being done. It is present when God's will is controlling the heart and life of the Christian. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, and remember the Lord taught it in the same sermon, we pray, as we did only a few minutes ago, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the same thing just said differently, so that people would understand the concept, because where God's kingdom is, it is there that His will is being done. And where God's will is being done, He obviously rules there, which means that that is His kingdom territory. When a Christian believer truly understands that without God, he or she has nothing, but that in a relationship with God's Son, Jesus Christ, they have everything, and that they are empty vessels that can only be filled by God, then they can be used by Him, and the kingdom of heaven is theirs. May you recognize that your supposed wealth is only fool's gold, and admitting your need for God's true riches, Throw yourself on his mercy and receive his blessings. Amen. I close this service with a blessing from the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.